Hello everyone, this is Dave and I'm going to be walking you through the final exam review for our Survey 1 class. The final exam itself covers material that we've gone over after the midterm. So for the midterm we covered everything from prehistory up into the Etruscan era and now we're going to begin with Roman art. Keep in mind also that this is going to be a review. It is nothing more than that. It does not take the place of any lecture that you should have watched and taken a part of. Keep in mind that at the greatest extremes of the Roman Empire, it was pretty much throughout Europe, the Middle East, North Africa, all the way down into the Indus Valley. So our first work that we're really looking at is the Augustus of Prima Porta. And there would have been many of these, and perhaps even the original would have been done in bronze. This served as political propaganda, letting you know who was ruling the territory. The sculpture also shows an idealized version of our ruler. Uh, perhaps younger, more handsome, more athletic. But you also have here the tie-in to the gods which the rulers were descended from. So down at the base we have Cupid reaching up, kind of grabbing onto this guy's toga. And then the breastplate at the right uh, shows a whole bunch of different versions of the earth gods and sky gods Again, letting you know that this person is very much related to the gods. The Arapacus, or the Altar of Peace, is one of the more important structures. Keep in mind that just like Greek architecture and sculpture, this would have been painted very bright, very loud colors, and absolutely beautiful to see in person. So Augustus established the Roman peace, and that caused the building of this altar. It's kind of ironic that the fragments of this work were discovered in the early 1900s and reconstructed under the rule of Mussolini. And here we have some relief sculpture. both humans and plant material. Many of the individuals in the top have been identified. Then here we have the founding of Rome. And keep in mind that the Romans also gave us the arch. Up until this time, we have the post and lentil system, which might give us uh, an expanse of 20 or 25 feet of uninterrupted space. And this is something that, you know, when we first learn to build with blocks as kids, this is the format that we have. It's the way our doorways are. It's the way early civilizations such as the Greeks built their structures. But now the Romans have given us the arch, which totally expands the amount of uninterrupted space we're able to create. The arch is made up of voussoirs, which are wedge-shaped stones. The last stone to go into place is the keystone. And the first time arches are used in a major building project is on the Pont du Gard, which covers the Nîmes River in France. This is not only a bridge, but it is an aqueduct. And these lower floors, where you see the arches so gigantic, they are just held together by weight. There is no mortar or any other building material keeping this together besides just the placement of the stones. The very top, that's going to be where the water for the aqueduct is being transported literally 20 miles from its source to the town of Nîmes. And it's also really important to know that this is a, a major project that was done in such a short period of time, only done in five years. And here's a, ver here's a view of the aqueduct. 
And even more importantly is the idea that all of a sudden man has control over nature. I mean, that's why the Romans are so important. They're the first people who build these grandiose structures. They invent the arch. And all of a sudden, they're able to really reign supreme over nature. When we look back at the early historical civilizations, for instance, in the Middle East and Egypt, these cities lived right next to the river. They needed a water source. But here, all of a sudden, we can transport water inland to where the water is needed by a new city. Make sure you're very familiar with the Colosseum. Keep in mind that the Colosseum is unique because it is two amphitheaters positioned back to back. Um, Greeks and also early Roman theaters were very much like this, where they were kind of a semicircle or arch, kind of like a tympanum in a way. And then they were open on the other end. Well, here, this is our first kind of true stadium with the Colosseum. You'll also notice on the outside that, that we have on the ground floor the Doric order, second floor is the Ionic, third floor is the Corinthian. This is also a building that is made all of concrete, and it was a prefabricated building. They had molds for this structure, and so it was very easy to build. They also had to drain a swamp, which is what this sits on. And again, it's man controlling nature. The original name of the Colosseum would have been the Vespian Amphitheater. All sorts of things took place here from naval battles, animal hunts, execution of criminals, and the way that you would, before I go on to that slide, the way that you would uh, be sitting here is depending on importance or social class. Uh, the emperor, for instance, and the dignitaries like that would be sitting at the very base and then the citizens and then finally uh, at the very top, non-citizens. So here we have the column of Trajan, which is really an awesome work. It is in Trajan's forum and the square base here would have been a tomb. Again, this is the idea of the ancient Roman streets are far below the level of the current contemporary streets. So that's why this looks like it's been buried and then um, resurrected in a way. There is a circular staircase that goes around the inside, but what's more important is what's wrapped around the outside is again this wonderful relief sculpture that talks about the two major campaigns that Trajan waged against the Dacian Empire. And Trajan himself appears multiple times in this work, and we kind of read it from the bottom to the top. You'll see these little slits throughout the column, and they are basically windows. And also, as we walk around the structure, or we see it from its neighboring buildings, the higher you get up into the relief sculpture, the wider these bands are. So near the bottom, there may be only a couple of feet wide. Near the top, they're about three, three and a half feet wide. And we have the Pantheon, probably the best preserved of all the ancient Roman structures. It's an absolutely stunning building. It has a lot of wear along the outside. You can definitely see that in the pediment, that triangular structure above the columns in front. Um, it is made out of concrete, and it, of course, looks like a Greek temple from the front, but when you go in, it is a circular building. And if you turn an arch 360 degrees, you get a dome or a hemisphere, and that is what has been constructed here. Although when you would approach this building in ancient Roman times, you wouldn't be able to see the main part of the structure until you entered. So it was definitely a, a surprise. There was a video that I posted from Smart History. Definitely go and revisit that video and you'll see all the mathematics involved. Keep in mind the Corinthian columns along the colonnade here, letting you know that this is absolutely a Roman structure. 
and also do not mix up the name Pantheon with the Greek Parthenon that we find on top of the Acropolis. The hole in the center of the dome is called the oculus, or that's the Latin term for eye, which is the building's light source. The walls here are 20 feet thick, no windows around the building, so that's why we have the oculus. It is also the resting place for Raphael, who's one of the great Renaissance artists. You'll learn about him in the Survey 2 class. As we get toward the end of the Roman Empire, this is where we have the mummy portraits, which are very multicultural in a way. Remember that the Roman Empire spanned Europe, North Africa, Indus Valley. Here, this is an artwork that takes place during the Roman Empire. Stylistically, it is Greek. However, the use of it is absolutely Egyptian. So definitely multicultural. And of course, the Romans absolutely love the art of the Greeks. We have this term Hellenism that's all about the idea of spreading Greek art and culture. Unfortunately, with the fall of the Roman Empire, we also have a reversion in terms of art. Uh, we saw the arrival of so such naturalistic looking figures when we talked about the Greek Empire and that stayed for most of the Roman. But as the Roman Empire falls, art reverts back to how it was before, not very individual, uh, very much looks like a cookie cutter type of art. It also becomes very frontal. We have less detail. And, of course, we have the splitting up of the Roman Empire uh, into two different segments. The Arch of Constantine, which Constantine never would have seen. He left Rome after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, where he beat another Roman emperor. And, of course, this is a time of great civil war. And from Rome, we're going to move on to the chapter on Late Antiquity and Byzantium. So during this time, the fall of the Roman Empire, we have a huge switch in terms of religion. We go from a polytheistic culture, one of many gods, to a singular god, a monotheistic culture. We're going to be walking through several churches during this chapter, the first, first being the Church of Santa Costanza. And keep in mind that the churches during this age are round, they are ambulatory. And a lot of these structures are going to be called baptistries because this is the place where you would be baptized. Uh, it is a centrally planned church, uh, meaning that the altar kind of resonates from the center and then the church works its way out. So it's kind of uh, radial balanced. Santa Costanza is among the earliest surviving of these types of churches, and this was originally intended as a mausoleum to Emperor Constantine's daughter, Constantina. And what we're going to see during the Middle Ages, primarily during the Romanesque Age, on through the early Renaissance, is churches that are going to be constructed in more of a cross-shaped pattern, where we have a nave, which is where the congregation sits, which ends up being the altar at the end, and then a transept, which is also called the crossing. But this is the Church of Santa Costanza. This is an old engraving. You can see the ambulatory around the outside, this again kind of curved arch that continues throughout. We also have these wonderful Corinthian column pedestals. And of course, one arch placed in front of the other, in this case with the ambulatory, but can also be straight, as in the case of a nave or a transept. These are called barrel vaults. 
And of course, at the top, this one, we have mosaics. Mosaics are small pieces of stone, glass, or tile fitted together to create a pattern or an image. They can be located anywhere. They can be up on the walls and ceilings, but they can also be on the floors. And during the late Roman Empire and throughout the Middle Ages, this was one of the most popular of artistic mediums. Not on the study guide, but I think worth mentioning here is the sarcophagus of Junius Bassus. And this is found in St. Peter's Cathedral today. Uh, this is a guy who was a governor of the Roman Empire, but you can definitely see the artwork is now becoming much more Christian. We have Christ at the center of this work. In fact, he is stepping on the head of a pagan god. So we have here the scene of the triumph of Christianity. The mausoleum of Gala Placidia is a really cool work. It's not round, but it is much more of a plus-shaped structure when viewed from the sky. And this is also work that is created with reused bricks. One of the reasons that there's very few surviving intact Roman structures is because we would constantly recycle the material. And it was a definitely a cost-effective way. Another reason that we don't have a lot of great Roman structures is the city of Rome itself is kind of swamp-like land. And building on that, they didn't have really the grasp of soil tectonics back in the ancient civilization. So a lot of these buildings fell down just because the land underneath them shifted. And that's just the story of Gala Placidia, who she's related to. But I wanted to mostly show you the inside of this mausoleum, heavily covered in mosaics. Some of these mosaics, we have the glass protruding out at an angle to capture the candlelight. And it would almost so kind of make the image look as if it was shimmering. As we exit, we'd have the Good Shepherd over the doorway, a very young version of Christ, clean-shaven. And a zoom in also of the mosaics. The Church of San Vitale is famous also for the mosaics inside. This church will look at a particular uh, set of them. This is also a church that is octagonal in shape, so it's really kind of, uh, kind of unique in structure. Again, the bricks for this church also recycled. And the mosaics that we're going to look at are on either side of the altar. Here we have Emperor Justinian and his attendants, and we have Justinian as a stand-in for Christ. We've got the halo around his head, making him a religious figure. And he does have his religious advisors off on our right, his military advisors off on our left, and he's carrying a bowl, which would eventually carry bread, which would be part of the Eucharist. You'll notice also that these figures are kind of floating in space. There's no particular ground line where they're standing. Across the altar, we have Theodora, who is a stand-in for Mary. We even have the three wise men emblazoned on her dress. She's also got a halo around her head, surrounded by her advisors, and she's carrying a goblet, which would be filled with wine, which is the other part of the Eucharist. And probably one of my favorite churches that we covered during this section is the Hagia Sophia. And this is located in Constantinople during its time, during the fall of Constantinople in 1453. It becomes Istanbul. That's when this church becomes a mosque and we have those four minarets on the corners being erected. 
but we're mostly concerned with the church itself built in 532. It is a major building project that the emperor sets in place because of um, some urban unrest and they destroy the building that was on this location and so he puts everyone to work by building this monumental church. Hagia Sophia translates into Holy Wisdom. And this is a five-year project, an absolutely gigantic space. So it has served as a church and a mosque. Today it's a museum. You can even get married here. But what's startling about it is that this is the first time in a major building that we have a round dome on a square structure. So in order to support the dome, we have these pendentives, which are defined as curving wall sections set between arches, and they curve inward to support a dome. And with all the windows around the base of the dome, it almost looks like it's floating. Now this is also not only the first time that pendentives are used in a major building project, it is still the way we support a dome on a square building today, which is the modern structure you see here at the left. And the Hagia Sophia is also important because we have a lot of uncovering of mosaics that were covered over in the 7th and 8th centuries. Iconoclasts would go around and destroy graven images of Christ. So a lot of churches would plaster these over and over time their locations were lost. And now with our wonderful technology today, we're able to kind of peer through the walls to see if there's any mosaics. And of course, there's a huge effort today in their restoration. So let's move into early medieval Europe and Romanesque art. Now these are the first two of three sections of what are considered the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages, the Medieval Empire. And this is basically where we see classical art, art of the Greek and Roman era ending, and we're in this area of uncertainty. We don't have a whole lot of documentation about what goes on during this time. We know it's very unstable, and unfortunately, very little art exists from this time. Now, in the year 1400, we're going to emerge again into the Renaissance, which is a term we use, it's literally translates into rebirth, where we look back at the classical age and we bring those ideas and ideals forward. So in the early medieval Europe portion of the Middle Ages, we have the Sutton Hu burial ship. And this is on a farm located on the southeastern portion of England. And there's a whole bunch of mounds here. And in the largest mound, when it was excavated in the 1930s, we find this ship. And this is not a ship that would have gone to sea. It is a ceremonial ship. The person who was buried here had definitely some type of importance, but we don't exactly know who it was. Of the artifacts that are taken from this location, the most famous is this purse cover. And it's absolutely beautiful in terms of design. It's almost Viking in a way with its interlacing and abstract figures. This is how it would have looked on a real purse. And what is interesting about this as well is that the purse itself rotted centuries ago, but still the gold coins that were in the purse were still underneath the purse lid. Again, showing you the warlike time that this was, we have this wonderful helmet. We also had weapons and shields that were recovered. Here are the gold coins that were under the purse lid. Now we're going to go up to Norway and look at one of the stave churches. At a time, there were over 2,000 of these types of churches. Now just a handful of them exist. A lot of times, parts from these other churches were built, were taken down to help rebuild some of the more important churches. You can see the steepness of the roof. This will let you 
not have to worry about snow buildup on the roof as the snow will just slide down. And these are definitely very dark interiors. Unfortunately, a lot of these churches did burn down because of the candles that were used to light them. They are covered in tar to help preserve the wood. So every five years, a fresh coating of tar is applied and you can see the wonderful textural element that this adds to that church. And this is on the outside of that stave church we were looking at. The door panels predate the building. So this was taken from another structure and incorporated into the church's north wall. Similar to Viking pagan art, we have stylized mythical figures intertwined among foliage. The equestrian portrait of Charles the Bald. And remember for a long time we thought this was Charlemagne, but it was not. We've got this figure also only stands about nine, nine and a half inches in height. This is much different than those wonderful sculptures that we saw during the Roman ages that were greater than life size. Now you can definitely see the change in sculpture during the Middle Ages. This is also a very important time for books and manuscripts. This is where we start to get the church serving as the patron for art. And this is gonna be something that's very important as we move into the Renaissance. The Book of Kells was created in Ireland or Scotland around 800 AD. And this page particularly has the letters XPI, Chiro Iota, which spell out the word Christ. And you can see Christ kind of here at the end of the letter P. We also have some wonderful uh, figures throughout the work and definitely return back to the lecture on this topic and take a look at some of those individual items. The page alone uh, would take about a month to produce. This was created in what was called a scriptorium where you would have a team of monks or nuns working on this page. And they're also gonna be producing jewelry, carvings, and textiles and figure as well this is a time where most people in the world were illiterate and the people with the knowledge particularly of writing and reading would have been the monks this is the lindisfarne gospels you can see what a beautifully heavily decorated cover this has with jewels on it one of the pages from the lindisfarne gospels heavily decorated again, kind of like that emblems of the Vikings, the designs of them. And then this is uh, the Lindau Gospels, and again, heavily decorated with jewels. And the technique for the metal, how the metal was created, creating these scenes, is repousse, which is when you take a soft metal, like copper, or particularly gold, as you see here, and it's hammered from the opposite side, that is what's creating the image on the front. So it's not material taken away as in standard relief sculpture, but this is where we take material and we're pushing it forward. St. Michael's in Germany, a very cool church. This is a church that not only has a nave, but it has two transepts instead of one. So it's not quite cross-shaped. The most famous part of this church are the doors. And particularly here, these are made out of bronze. Bronze is very, very expensive. And we have both scenes from the Old Testament at the left and the New Testament at the right. We do have similar themes and ideas presented opposite one another in the two doors. For instance, in the temptation and fall, and we have Eve and Adam, each with an apple in their hands, and we have the tree between them. Opposite that is the crucifixion, so the tree is very similar in shape to the cross that Christ is on, and we also have two Romans 
on either side of him. Moving on to Romanesque Europe, this is the middle part of the Middle Ages. And during this time, we have pilgrims that would visit churches throughout France and northern Spain, and they would go to visit these churches to see the relics that these churches would contain. One such church on a pilgrimage route would be St. Cernan, which is more of our typical cross-shaped church. So we have the barrel vault that makes up both the nave, where the congregation sits, and the crossing, which is the transept. And it would have, a church would have different reliquaries. Uh, for instance, the reliquary of St. Foy, which I'll show you here. Again, heavily ornamented. Relics were thought to have special power. Um, and I should tell you that the reliquary of St. Foy is something that holds a relic. The relic is on the inside of that structure. Uh, again, relics could heal the sick, offer blessings that could minimize your time in purgatory, but most importantly, they were economic engines for the churches and the communities. And it would not be uncommon for a monk to take a position at a church for several years and then steal the reliquary and the relic and bring it back to their original church because this is what drove people to visit these locations. Another reliquary is that of St. Alexander, which is a little bit creepy since it is the size of a human head. And also in this chapter, I wanted to talk about tympanums. And tympanums are these curved wall sections set above doorways to churches. So as you're, during the Middle Ages, you're standing outside of the church, you're illiterate, and you can look up and still understand the stories of the Bible through, through this iconology. The most famous one that I show is this one here. This is the Last Judgment. The Last Judgment was a common theme because this is when Christ was supposed to have come back in 1000 AD during the Romanesque Age. So we have Christ here surrounded by a full body halo, the Mandorla, the saved on his right, the wing of the souls on his left, and beneath him the dead rising from their graves. I'd also like to tell you about the cathedral complex in general. As we move into the Renaissance age, we're going to be looking particularly at cathedral complexes. Now up in Pisa, we've got the baptistry in front, then we have the cathedral behind that, and the Leaning Tower of Pisa is the bell tower. So you have those three components. Later on in the class, we had talked about the Florence Cathedral. So again, we have the baptistry in front, the cathedral right behind it, and in this case, the bell tower designed by Giotto is off to the right. And now let's go into Gothic Europe. The Gothic Age is the third and final stage of the Middle Ages. And this is also a lecture where you guys really created it through the voice thread. So in terms of studying for the final exam, what you need to do is go back to the voice thread and click on some of the images from the other teams that worked on their particular cathedrals and learn about those. I'm going to cover some of the basic churches here, the Abbey Church of Saint Denis. And this is the first modern Gothic cathedral, which is kind of a unique terminology there because we think of modern as being much more contemporary. But in this case, what's happened is we've had a transition from the Romanesque type of church. And this is an interior of a Romanesque church. It tends to be very dark, dungeon-like. You can see the standard arch up above, but generally very few windows. By modern Gothic, this is what I'm talking about. All of a sudden the walls open up and we have a tremendous amount of windows and with the colored stained glass, all of a sudden it becomes a much more spiritual event. 
The arches also are not curved anymore. They become pointed arches. And I'll zoom into a few of those later on in this lecture. These buildings are absolutely gigantic. They're supposed to make you feel small in the presence of God. The Church of Saint-Denis has a number of French kings that were buried there. Unfortunately, many of the bodies were removed and destroyed during the French Revolution. As I mentioned, the Romans developed the arch. That's why this is so prominent in Romanesque churches. The barrel vault and the way weight is distributed out to the walls and the ground. The idea that if we line up arches one behind the other, we create a barrel vault and where two barrel vaults intersect, which is the crossing of the church, we get a groin vault and then C down below is ribbed vaults. But during the Gothic age, we have what is called the pointed arch being created. And this allows architects to make even taller structures than what we saw during the Romanesque age. The weight, however, is not transmitted so much out as it is straight down and tremendous pressure is put on the walls. And what happens is you have these churches that are being created. There's so much stress on the walls, the walls start to blow out and the church collapses. In order to prevent this from happening, architects help distribute the weight of the building through what are called flying buttresses. And flying buttresses are defined as extensions of interior arches. You see this during the Gothic age, and it also adds that Gothic mystique to these buildings. The Chat Cathedral in France is one of my favorites because of the two different towers that you see in the front of the church. And when you zoom in on those, and in this case, we're going to look at the one at the left, look how heavy that is. That's a Romanesque uh, tower. The one at the right is Gothic. Look how much more detail, much more ornament is placed onto the right. And here's perhaps even a better image. And I remember when I was a student, I learned that the blueprint for the tower at the right was found in the tower at the left. They had kind of used that as a base idea for this tower. The wonderful rose windows, I think there's three of them at this church. And look at the sculptural elements here. They're on the outside. They're very columnar. They're very frontal. They do not interact with one another. Amiens Cathedral. This is one I'm not going in today. And the reason that is, is because it does use the pointed arches. And I talked about the churches collapsing and if you can see the cursor, look at this crack off here to the right. And in this church, there's been a lot of work done, literally lasers put up and down these support columns here. And these laser beams go across this open expanse and they measure it. And they find out, for instance, that this area here is much wider than this area here but it gets wide again down here. So it almost has kind of this wave effect. And again, you can see this crack here. Once one of these supports go, all of them go. So again, this is not a church you will find me in today. I do not trust its construction. The Reims Cathedral in France, also absolutely beautiful. Uh, again, this is a uh, favorite of mine because it has been reconstructed in the modern age. And by modern, I mean after World War II. So I guess maybe even we could call that the postmodern age. Again, it utilizes the pointed forms of the uh, arches 
absolutely gigantic in terms of space. This is the way it looked after World War II, completely bombed into oblivion. And on the outside of the church, we have both the Annunciation and the Visitation. Again, these figures are very solitary, even though they're supposed to be interacting and tell part of a story. But this is where we start to see the transition into our next phase, which is the early Italian Renaissance. And we're going to start off by looking at the Renaissance during the 1300s. The name itself translates from the Italian word Renascimento, meaning rebirth, and that's exactly what this time period does. It is the re-emergence of civilization once it falls into the Dark Ages. So we cut the Renaissance into three basically equal parts. We're going to be looking at the early Renaissance during this section of the review, and we'll also be looking at a little bit of the middle Renaissance. But only in Survey 2 will you really finish out the middle and the late or high Renaissance. During the Renaissance, we have cities that emerge, such as Padua and Florence. We'll visit those cities today. And then later on in the Renaissance, the cities of Rome and Venice will become important. Remember that this is a horrible time in which to live, and it is surprising when we look back that anything of any substance emerged from this time period. First of all, political-wise, Europe does not exist as it does today. In fact, Italy, as you saw in the previous map, is broken up into different republics. Even though they're all speaking the same language, there are going to be different dialects between them. Unfortunately, a lot of times these republics or city-states are at war with one another. This is a male-dominated society. We have religious persecution, constant warfare, famines, floods, and disease. Now, the number one disease that you need to be aware of is the plague. And this is going to strike several times during the Renaissance, basically every decade. But about once a century, you have a major outbreak. And in this case, it is in 1348, where half of the population of Europe is killed. Now, this is also going to happen again in 1427. The painting medium we're using during this age is tempera. And tempera is traditionally painted on wood panels simply because we haven't realized we can use canvas to paint on. And that's not going to happen until the very late 1400s, around 1484. Tempera is comprised of pigment and egg yolk. And oil paint will be invented in the early 1400s, around 1426 that's going to totally move tempera off the map. So keep in mind that this is going to be one of the essay questions on the exam. This is the uh, switch over from Byzantine or Gothic art, which you see at the left, represented by the artist Cimabue, and the very first artist of the Renaissance, Giotto, at the right. There's a whole bunch of different things going on in these altarpieces, and of course, both of them are fairly large. Uh, Chimabui's work at the left about 12 feet, Giotto in at about 10 and a half, and then we've got a totally different, even though the scene is the same, it's the enthroned Madonna and child with saints and angels, um, it's a totally different composition between the two. Look at how very frontal, uh, excuse me, look at how very frontal and flat the work at the left is, and then over at the right, we have a lot better depiction of space. Look at the figures of the Madonna and how the clothes and the natural fall of the drapery appear at the right compared to that at the left. I mean, at this point, it looks like she's almost going to slide off of that throne. We also have a problem with accessibility. We cannot get to the Madonna in the image at the left. We have to crawl over some profits in order to do that, whereas at the right, we have this wonderful passageway. And look at where all the angels are looking. 
there at the right. Everyone is focused in on the Madonna. This is a technique that is used to establish a focal point and it's called line of sight. The work at the left, man, those angels are just waiting to get off of work. They're just kind of looking off to the left and off to the right. You know, they're not really focused in on the Madonna, which is really where we're supposed to be looking. The terminology that I like to use at, on the work at the right is mimesis, which means to replicate or to reproduce. In this case, Giotto is reproducing or replicating nature. And that is the goal for the Renaissance artist. We want to see a scene that looks exactly like the real world. And again, keep in mind that we are trying to mimic nature. We are not trying to mimic the previous work done by Cimabue, who happens to be Giotto's, uh, Giotto's teacher. So Giotto is going to work in the workshop of Cimabue for several years. And these artworks are done about 20 years apart. The best remaining works of Giotto are at the Arena Chapel in Padua. We call it the Arena Chapel since it was built on the grounds of an ancient Roman arena. Inside we have these wonderful fresco paintings, the life of the Virgin, the life of Christ, and above the entrance door there we have the Last Judgment. But look at how different these characters are compared to those sculptures outside the Reims Cathedral in France. We had figures that were just standing next to each other, kind of nodding to one another that, hey, how are you? You know, you're right next to me. Here, these characters are showing emotion. They're interacting. It's really a great work. However, there's still some problems. We have the funky architecture, doesn't look true to size. We have the general flatness of the scene. We have not invented linear perspective yet. That'll happen in about another hundred years. And then finally, we have the lack of light source. Everything here is equally bathed in light and the figures do not cast any shadows. And again, that's something we'll see in the next century. As we exit the Last Judgment, we have this scene right at the base of the cross which is the detail at the right, of Enrico Scrovini, the patron of this work of art. He's the one who paid Giotto to create it, offering the Arena Chapel to the Virgin Mary in repentance for his sins that he committed. So this is basically him buying his way into heaven. Now, as I mentioned, these are all done in fresco. You need to know a little bit about fresco. It is the Italian word for fresh. And it's something we did cover early on in the ancient civilizations course. Basically, your workers would apply fresh plaster to a wall you would be painting. Your chemicals would be emulsified in lime water. You would have a cartoon or spolvero that would be basically a preliminary drawing and outline of what you were going to create. The image would be transferred to that wall and you would paint then the outline. So kind of like a coloring book in a way. Once the paint or the wall dries, where the paint has been applied, that's where you have the permanence of fresco. And that's one of its most important attributes is that this painting is gonna last as long as the building does. Fresco is painted during the summertime, is painted from the top down, we do have a limited color palette. Unfortunately, not all colors are going to be water soluble. And fresco painting is very slow and methodical. A full size figure is going to take two days to paint. We also have the term fresco seco. And here, this is painting on dried plaster. Obviously, nowhere near as permanent. And it wasn't used too often basically to correct mistakes or to meet deadlines when fresco painting would not have been applicable or doable in that time. But as you can see from this painting here, and don't get me wrong, da Vinci was never asked to paint fresco on this wall. He's literally doing a huge 15 by 30 foot oil painting on the luncheon room 
of the Santa Maria della Grazia. And this is to show you how the paint itself has flaked off the wall over centuries. Now there has been major restoration effort, but you can still see only about 20 to 25 percent of the original paint remains, and the figures are very, very ghostly. Had this been done in true fresco, this would have been done as beautiful or look today as beautiful as the Sistine Chapel does. So we talked about Enrico Scrovini being one of the patrons of the arts during the Renaissance. Patrons included wealthy families, and of course the Medici family probably the most important, and you did see a short video on the Medici family. Then we have the church, primarily the Pope is designating what he wants to have created. And of course, this is why you have so much religious work during this time period is because the Pope is not going to commission landscape scenes. He's going to be mostly interested in annunciations and crucifixions and so on. Pope Julius II at the right, and he's going to be important during the late or high Renaissance. He is the one who brings Michelangelo down to paint the Sistine ceiling. We also have guilds, which are very similar to labor unions. No matter what job you had in Italy during this time, you belong to a guild. And then we also have city governments such as Florence and Siena off to the right. And these individuals are also commissioning art, such as the Statue of David. We talked about the Maesta by Duccio. This is a polyptic, it's a gigantic multi-paneled altarpiece. We have both the front and the back here. Other terms from the study guide that we did not cover would be diptych, which is a two-paneled altarpiece or painting. We have a triptych, which is a more common three-paneled work and not only that but normally in these works we see them open in this position but they can also be closed and there would be a painting on the closed version as well these types of paintings would be open on Sundays or specific religious days polyptic multi-paneled altarpiece hieratic scale or a hierarchical scale uh, lets you know that the largest person in this painting is the most important. And of course, it's the Madonna and Child. She's about three to four times as large as any of the other angels here, and she's in a sitting position. Mimesis we covered, which is just to mimic uh, or to reproduce. The focus is nature. And now we'll cover Italy in the 15th century. Keep in mind that in a normal situation, we wouldn't be covering this much material in a Survey 1 class, but unfortunately I couldn't show a movie I had intended to have you watch during the last week of class. So we went on a little bit further into the Renaissance and primarily were concerned about Filippo Brunelleschi and his creation of the dome on top of the Florence Cathedral. So, the, of course, the cathedral complex is made up of the cathedral, the bell tower, and the baptistry. And this is where we first learn about Filippo Brunelleschi. He's in his early 20s at this time, and unfortunately, so is another individual by the name of Lorenzo Ghiberti. So, there's a contest held with the winner given the commission to create the set of north doors for the baptistry. And they're, of course, made of bronze, which is a very expensive metal to work with. The project is funded by the Wool Merchants Guild. Giovanni de' Medici happens to be one of the judges. It really came down to about five individuals, but only two of them are famous today, and that's why we normally consider it a contest between Ghiberti and Brunelleschi. So we have Ghiberti's work here, and the shape of this, I probably did not mention it during the lecture, but it is called a quatrefoil. And then this is Brunelleschi's work. And a lot of people say that this work should have been the one that should have won the commission. That it's more easily read, the narrative is more clear, the figure is more pronounced, 
more of a truly active scene. However, the reason, and when we look at these, compare them with one another, the winner happens to be the other individual, the one at the left, Lorenzo Ghiberti. Not because of the rendering of the figures or of the scene or anything like that, but what ends up happening when we turn the sculpture around is that we find that it is created from one piece of bronze instead of several pieces, which is what Brunelleschi did. So he basically showed that he had a better working technique than Brunelleschi did. He used less bronze, and because he used less bronze, the work would have cost less money, and that's why he won the award. Of course, it takes him about 23 years to complete the doors on the cathedral, or excuse me, on the baptistry. But then he gets commissioned to do the next set of doors, the east doors, which Michelangelo will coin the gates of paradise in about another century. Don't forget that Brunelleschi is the one that creates the dome on top of the Florence Cathedral and the way he does this is to really create two domes, a smaller inner dome and then a larger outer dome with space in between for access. Um, Brunelleschi, after he lost the contest for the doors of the baptistry, left Florence and spent some time in Rome learning about all the ancient Roman structures and really concentrated on architecture. So when he came back to Florence, he was definitely relied as an architect. And so when he came back to Florence, he was definitely looked upon as an architect. Of course, the Florentines wanted to create the largest dome in the Western world. And up to that time, it was the Pantheon, which we just previously covered. The Pantheon is about 140 feet in diameter, whereas the Florence Cathedral is 143 and a half feet in diameter. Here's our passageway in between the domes. And of course, the lantern was created after Brunelleschi finished the dome. And then a century later, we have the interior ceiling being painted. Brunelleschi himself buried at the Florence Cathedral. During the same time of the construction of the dome, he was also building the Hospital of the Innocents. This is not a hospital in the traditional sense. This is an orphanage. But what is unique about it is this is the first time in a thousand years a truly Roman building is constructed in Italy. Consider the arches, the Corinthian columns, the pediments over the windows. All of these are definitely Roman in style. And if you would watch the movie Medici Godfathers of the Renaissance, you will actually see parts of this building in that film and how difficult it was for the workers to create this structure because the public was always coming to view this building because no one had seen anything constructed like this ever before. Brunelleschi also gives us linear perspective. He's the one that codifies it. And since we just spent some time on this and I have a lot of supporting documentation on the canvas system, I'm not gonna go through linear perspective step by step. I will tell you to keep in mind the very common terms such as horizon line, which is where the ground and the sky meet, the vanishing point, which is all where the parallel lines or orthogonals meet, and this is the way that we can create a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface through mathematics, meaning that everyone can do this. The last slide, I'm just going to be uh, reminding you that if you had not watched it, you do need to watch the Medici Godfathers of the Renaissance. It's available on YouTube. I do have the link on Canvas. You just need to watch part one as it deals with the building of the dome on the Florence Cathedral. 
And this is going to wrap up our review of Survey 1. Good luck on the final exam.